monumental work, the Gulag Archipelago, which appeared in the West in the mid-1970s. That came out strictly in the outside world, not within the Soviet Union. The impact of this book is hard to overstate because there were still illusions in the West at that time that somehow the Soviet Union may have had a bad period during the Stalin uh, era, but it was basically moving in the right direction. But there's no question that Solzhenitsyn played a, a principal role, not only in initiating this literature inside the Soviet Union, even if it couldn't be circulated freely, but alerting the West to the scale of this repression. The West was thus awakened in the 70s to the continuing horrors of the labor camps. Into this litany of statistics and collective tragedies comes the individual. The cruelty and crime visited upon Russian citizens was monumental. In his monstrous paranoia, Stalin grimly cast a dark shadow over his own people. There seemed to have been a quota at different times that the police in different communities simply had to arrest so many people. And so this was not only a form of intimidation uh, of the population, which I think was its primary purpose, uh, but it also reflected a certain paranoia in the part of Stalin that if he knew there were certain obvious opponents in a city or in a community, he would arrest a hundred to make sure he got those three people. The intrigues were endless, usually beginning with a whisper, a suspicion, an errant comment, a note, a touch of treachery, even a foolish prank leading suddenly to an arrest. Almost anybody at any time knew there could be a knock on the door in the middle of the night and they could be taken away. And in fact, in the height, at the height of certain waves of terror in the late 30s and again in 1948, um, there were many people who feared arrest who simply kept a little packed bag by their beds because they knew that you know, if somebody came to the door to take them to prison, they'd want to have certain things with them. They'd want to have a change of clothes. They'd want to have a little bit of money. They'd want to have some soap, things like that. So it was a very prevalent fear. Anyone and everyone could be snared in this dragnet. A clergyman, a politician, a businessman or thief. A naive student carried away with his own bombast. A pathetic peasant of absolutely no power or influence. Everyone was vulnerable. The government was truly a ministry of fear. The appearance of legality was terribly important to the Russian state. There were trials held, even if they were one-minute trials or 30-second trials. Every prisoner had a trial and every prisoner was sentenced. This was part of the way in which the gulag was justified to the people who were charged with carrying it out. Every guard was told these prisoners are criminals, they've had a trial, they're enemies of the people, it's been proved. And then came what may have been the worst ordeal of the entire experience, the transport by train to one's penal destination, from Moscow to the Arctic Circle, or some parched Siberian wasteland, or barren Kazakhstan, or the far, far east, 10 time zones distant, in the remote corner of the Soviet Union. The experience of getting there was usually horrific. Prisoners were put into cattle cars, um, often with nothing, it would just simply be an empty car, handed a loaf of bread, and effectively told that's all they were gonna get for a week or for two weeks. Doors were shut, and the guards would have no further communication with the prisoners during the trip. So these trains became terrible death traps. In the summer, they were incredibly hot. In the winter, they were incredibly cold. Prisoners literally died of thirst. They fought with one another. They murdered one another inside these cars. There were no toilets, obviously, so the, you know, the stench was unbearable. The gold mines of Kolyma are silent now. Called the land of white death, the ruins of Kolyma cannot recount the damage done to millions of Russian souls and bodies. It could be called the Auschwitz of the Soviet Union. Stalin's interest in the region was keen. 
production was monitored closely. Conditions were horrible. The worst place of all in reputation among Gulag prisoners, as well as in general by those who had escaped from the Gulag, was Kalima, which is in the area now known as Magadan. It's one of the coldest areas in which people have ever lived, but the people who were brought there were not living there voluntarily. No one would endure those types of temperatures. You're talking about 60 below zero, 70 below zero at times. And the idea of putting the camp there was in part to be able to exploit the gold, mineral, and other resources in that area. So high was the attrition, a highway built by the laborers at Colima became known as the Road of Bones. A poet and survivor of Colima, Yuri Lvovich Fidelgoltz, talks about the harshness of these conditions at Colima and other locales in the remote area of Magadan. After Ozirlag, they transferred me to Colima. I met there a doctor who managed to stay there at a medical station, avoiding transportation further up north. The doctor saved my life, taking me as an assistant, although I had no medical education at all. I spent about two or three months at the transfer camp in Magadan. Magadan was a deadly place, a most scary place for me. All worked there were hard manual labor and considering prisoners' weak health condition, it was impossible to fulfill our daily job quotas. I got thin very quickly, or, using the camp slang, turned into a daha jaga, one walking the last steps to the end. I was not able to do anything at all. Death was waiting for me. However, I preferred to die at the punishment block rather than die at work as a slave. That is why I refused to work. That is how I became an Atkaschik, a prisoner refusing to work. Eventually, Fidel Goltz was freed and returned to Moscow, afflicted with a serious case of tuberculosis, brought on by his physical ordeals in the frigid regions of Magadan. It was in the Gulag short story collection, Kolima Tales, that poet survivor Valam Shalamov fittingly states, a human being survives by his ability to forget. Mikhail Rogachev works for Repentance, a Russian organization which researches records and documents the fate of prisoners, particularly in Komi. The prisoners were not tortured on purpose but they were subject to constant cold, hunger, and hazing by the guards. It was completely permissible to kill a prisoner with no punishment for it, just by claiming he was trying to escape. You could put them in cold incarceration, and this was not considered torture. This is a room with a concrete floor, concrete walls, and no heating. And this is where the temperatures reach 30 or 40 degrees below Celsius. That is torture. Fabled White Sea Canal project, dearest of all to Stalin's black heart, was its own type of death camp. Slave laborers worked with primitive tools in abominable conditions to construct 141 miles of waterways with 19 locks. It was to have been Stalin's masterpiece. There had been proposals to build a canal from the White Sea to connect to the Baltic Sea 
for many, many years. This went back far before the Soviet regime, almost to the time of Peter the Great. What was different in the early 1930s when this was done is that Stalin was willing to commit the resources and the human lives to do it. So this canal was completed in 1933 using prisoners from the newly formed Gulag. You're talking at, at the height there were more than 100,000 prisoners working on this canal. But it didn't work, which surprised few experts. It was insufficiently deep or wide and was frozen over for six months of the year. At least 25,000 workers died on the project, which in the end proved to be nothing more than a colossal waste of time and especially of lives. Evgenia Kaidorova works on human rights issues in the region of Komi. Work went throughout the daylight hours. In the morning they ate balanda, a type of gruel. And if they had fulfilled their quota, they received 400 grams of bread. They weren't fed any dinner, so they would drink the gruel, or stash the bread, or divide it, and keep a part of it for dinner. And for supper, after they had worked 12 to 14 hours, there was again a thin gruel. It was a matter of luck where you landed. But no matter where you were or when, if you resisted or protested or fought back, you were in trouble. Solitary confinement was the least of the senses, and it was none too pleasant. Vladimir Osipov, a gulag survivor, knew this firsthand. There were concrete walls, essentially concrete floors, covered only with planks. It was horribly cold. You'd be in your underwear and undershirt. There was nowhere to take shelter. You'd tremble from the cold. That was the way the KGB and bosses of the camp would act. Very early on, the Soviet secret police made a decision to mix criminal and political prisoners. That meant that the camps were in effect run by the criminal prisoners. You know, there would be a mafia boss at the camp and he would have people who did his bidding and sometimes literally by murder and rape they would control the other prisoners. Leonid Borodin found himself in several prisons and camps because he saw the light following Stalin's death. Becoming a dissenter, I didn't recognize it until it happened. Our reality in those times, the 60s and late 50s, it gave a lot of reasons to ponder and to doubt. And the deciding factor here was the 20th Party Congress, with its denouncement of the cult of personality. I grew up surrounded by love for Stalin. I was a loyal and dedicated pioneer and member of the Komsomol. I believed myself to be living in the happiest country in the world and the most just country, where injustice did not exist and where everyone got exactly what they deserve. The 20th Party Congress, with the denouncement of Stalin, the idol of my childhood, came as a great shock to me. It forced me to reevaluate my reality, and that reevaluation propelled me into dissent. <laughs> 